Thank you for joining us. Um, my calling uh, Assembly Committee on Education to order. Madam Secretary, will you please call roll? Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Flores. Present. Assemblywoman Gorlow. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Assemblywoman Krasner. Here. Assemblywoman Marzola. Assemblyman MacArthur. Here. Assemblywoman Miller. Uh, Assemblywoman Nguyen. Assemblywoman Tolls, Assemblywoman Torres, Chair Bill Bray Axelrod. Here. So we have eight members present. I believe the others should be joining us shortly. So mark them. I think Assemblywoman Miller just went to the bathroom. So just mark them present as they arrive. But we do have a quorum. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing we're going to do is not on the agenda, but um, I would like to invite Superintendent Ebert. Um, via Zoom, because we have a very special thing that happened in Nevada. So please go ahead, Superintendent. Oh, you're that on mute. Me, all dead. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, I'm unmuted. You're good now. Okay, great. Thank you. I've been doing the happy dance all morning. Um, so thank you, Chair uh, Bill Bray Axelrod, Vice Chair Miller, members of the Assembly Education Committee. I am just tickled pink um, to share with you that uh, today our Nevada Teacher of the Year was selected as the National Teacher of the Year. And we know that the teacher appreciation uh, this year is more important than ever. And I know you have several teachers on this body and I'm thankful for what they do each and every day because our educators provide more than instruction. They provide support for their students, the families, they provide supports for and interventions to meet our students where they are with their, with their unique needs. She is the third um, teacher of uh, National Teacher of the Year, who is a, a special education teacher. The program has been going for 69 years. Um, Nevada has had twice a Final Four uh, in, in this group, um, but never has had the national um, award. And and it is um, it is Juliana's. Um, recognition and award, but I know that this body would want to celebrate her as well. And so just a few things, if you have not had the opportunity uh, to meet Juliana, she actually serves on, I have a teacher's advisory uh, committee uh, that I tapped into, uh, quite frankly, once a week when the pandemic uh, started. And she is part of that uh, committee and they advised me right away of all of the needs of educators and families, social emotional learning supports, the devices, the connectivity, teachers needing high quality curriculum um, online uh, and you know the myriad of things that uh, the superintendents across our state, teachers, the community, the public private partnerships that have transpired during this pandemic um, it, it need to keep going uh, beyond this work. But she was one, one voice of many that was lifted when we all could have said, you know, this is a horrible situation, but taking the, the crisis and turning it into an opportunity. She is also known as Miss Earth uh, for her efforts in beautifying the schools. There are many videos, uh, and, I, and I know you will uh, take time to to look at them and see the great work. Um, but I just wanted to take a moment this year, or this year, excuse me, this afternoon uh, to celebrate uh, one of our own who is the National Teacher of the Year. Uh, Dr. Biden was there this morning. Uh, she had to arrive at school, uh, myself and also Superintendent Jara arrived at the school at 3.45 a.m. Uh, to help celebrate her. Um, and and this um, celebrate all teachers. So with that, you know, we're very fortunate uh, that she is going to amplify the voice of educators um, as one that she exemplifies the values of equity and inclusivity uh, that uh, you know drive the work across the state. 
So Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to share this great news with this body and many educators, PK20, um, uh, that sit here and, and do the great work on behalf of our children, the educators and the community as a whole. Thank you, Superintendent. We are so proud and it's just wonderful news. Total bright spot uh, in uh, this legislative session. So thank you. Okay, with that, we will get on to the task at hand, hearing three bills. We have three bills. We're gonna take them slightly out of order. Well, totally out of order. We're gonna start with SB 249, then we'll go to SB 151, and then we'll end with SB 193. So just a couple of things, if you're in the room, um, please turn your cell phones on to silent. Um, keep your masks on at all times. Um, be nice to each other. <laughs> and you can find everything on Nellis that we're, we are uh, referring to. Um, and then just the last thing is a lot of us have several different devices. So if we are looking down or looking away, please don't take that as a sign of disrespect. We're just trying to navigate this virtual, semi-virtual world. So um, I will open up the hearing on SB, what did I just say? 249, welcome Senator Dondero Loop. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I could not be more proud to be a teacher today. Um, I taught for 30 years and I promise you, I never had a day where I was sorry that I was a teacher. So for the record, I'm Marilyn Dondero Loop representing Senate District 8 in Clark County. And I have on the screen there, Caroline and Lauren Edgeworth, who are Hope Means Nevada teens, and they are here to present with me. I am pleased to present Senate Bill 249 for your consideration today. But before I start, I would like to say, while I am the only official sponsor on this bill, I want you to know that all teens are truly my co-pilots and co-sponsors. I know this statement, statement is just symbolic of them, but I would like to be able to acknowledge those that have assisted their friends, been involved in team mental health activities, and especially those that suffer from mental illness. Quite simply, the bill before you today provides additional authority for our mental health and behavioral health professionals to certify that pupils may be excused from attending school. The bill also provides additional information to students concerning mental health resources. I think we all recognize that the coronavirus disease of 2019 pandemic has provided challenges for our students' mental health and behavioral health. The impact of isolation due to remote learning has magnified the urgent concerns about student safety and well-being. In May, 29% of the United States parents reported that isolation was harming their children's emotional or mental health, and another 37% anticipated that lockdowns would have that more effect if they continued. In June, 30% of high schoolers said they were feeling depressed. And in November, our CDC released a report alerting the nation about the mental health crisis among students. According to the CDC, between April and October of 2020, hospital emergency departments saw a 31% increase in visits from school-aged children for mental health needs. We have known for some time that students need increased access to behavioral health services. A 2018 internal survey conducted by the School Superintendents Association indicated that students' behavioral health needs were the top concern of superintendents across the country. Here in Nevada, it is safe to say our superintendents are also concerned about student mental health, especially in light of recent increases of the number of student suicides. However, these tragedies have been a serious problem even before the pandemic, and it is clear that we need to do more to address this issue. Under Senate Bill 249, student ID cards will now include contact information concerning suicide prevention. This action will provide students with free and confidential support in times of suicidal crisis or emotional distress. An additional tool we need to employ concerns the authority to make a determination and certify that a student is unable to attend school or that it is not advisable for that person to attend school. Under current law, only a physician can make that determination. With the understanding that mental health and behavioral health concerns 
may be a factor in making this decision, it is important to authorize the trained specialists in these professions to also make that determination if it fails, I'm sorry, if it falls within the scope of their practice. <clears throat> At this time, I would like to describe the two significant sections in the bill itself. Section one requires the back of any identification card for a pupil in a public school, including charter schools, will now include mental health resource information, including the telephone numbers of national and local suicide prevention hotlines. Section two makes three changes to the statutes concerning excused attendance in school. First, it adds behavioral health to the list of authorized conditions that would allow a child's attendance to be excused. Second, Senate Bill 249 allows a mental health or behavioral health professional to certify that a child is not able to attend school or that a child's attendance is inadvisable. Third, the bill prohibits an excused attendance from having a negative effect on a school's accountability rating. In closing, it is clear that our K-12 students may, feel, may face social, emotional, and situational pressures that affect their school performance. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified these pressures. Our students need information about mental health resources that are available to them. In addition, as we emerge from the pandemic, it will be necessary to provide mental health and behavioral health professionals with the ability to make informed judgments about whether a student is able to attend school or whether attendance is even advisable. Senate Bill 249 accomplishes these policies. And now, Madam Chair, I would like to introduce Caroline and Lauren Edgeworth, who are sisters, and they have been um, very involved in leading the charge with teens involved with Hope Means Nevada. There are teens from all different schools all over the county. Um, Lauren and Caroline have just sort of taken the lead here. As you can see, they're in, in the lockers. They have been in several things today, and we had to excuse them from school for a minute. So if you would allow them time to speak, um, I would be so pleased and welcome um, Caroline and Lauren, and thank you so much for doing what you're doing and helping. Go ahead, ladies, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, and thank you so much, Senator Dondero Loop, for supporting this bill. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Caroline Edgeworth, and this is my sister, Lauren Edgeworth, and we're both high school students at Bishop Gorman High School in Las Vegas. And um, we just wanted to say thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to share our stories. So. Um, as Senator Donero Loop mentioned, we are the co-chairs for the Hope Means Nevada teen community, which is a statewide group of students who are aged from 10 to 21. And we're all working together to eliminate teen suicide in Nevada while normalizing conversations around mental health. Our mission is to, sorry, our mission is to destigmatize these conversations. And we want teens across Nevada to start talking about how we're truly feeling. We want to remind each other that it's not it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be sad, scared, angry, or lonely. We need to start talking about how to be mentally and physically healthy. Our campaign motto is hashtag ask five, which promotes people to ask five people how they're truly doing. We know that mental health education is suicide prevention. Sadly, we've already lost 23 students to death by suicide this year in Clark County alone. That's more than double compared to previous years. We know that many more kids our age are suffering with loneliness, anxiety, and depression. Almost all of our friends have experienced something similar during the pandemic, and we have as well. Even before the pandemic, one in five of us already suffered with mental health issues, and the rate of youth in distress was already on the rise. Teens with mental health conditions increased by more than 50% between 2007 and 2017. Suicide is one of the leading causes of death among teenagers, and this year has been very difficult for both of us. The pressure of schoolwork, being disconnected from our friends and teammates has been overwhelming. We've lost our rites of passage in high school, such as homecoming, prom, sports, which are a large part of our identity and recruiting, and seniors have also lost graduation. The list continues. I was only a sophomore when the pandemic began, and recognizing what was happening to our community and our friends, we jumped at the opportunity to get involved with Hope Means Nevada. 
And we were fortunate enough to watch a TED Talk by Haley Hardcastle on the benefit of mental health days. It really made sense to us. As athletes, students, and people who just want to give back and be involved in our community, we're sometimes overwhelmed with the stresses of life, schoolwork, friends, and trying to be perfect all the time on social media. There are days where we just want a break, a break from everything in life. In the summer of 2020, we watched Haley Hardcastle show us that it was okay to take one of these days because one single day can make a difference and save a life. We wanted to talk about how this bill could help. So once a mental health day is taken, it's noted by the student's counselors, and we hope that this will activate a chain of events where the student is evaluated and determine what type of assistance they need. Uh, the parents should also know that a mental health day was taken, and they will also be notified as well. If a day two or day three was taken, there should be a system in place to get the student the mental health assistance that they need. Nevada ranks one of the lowest in the country for mental health assistance, and we hope that this will change the enactment of, from this bill. By using, mental, by using teen mental health days as a way to start the conversation with parents and counselors, this would be a strong tool to identify teens who are struggling. We believe if we had this bill in place, we could have saved those 23 lives. Depression and suicidal thoughts are often suffered in silence, unbeknownst from teachers, parents, and even some of the people's closest friends. Sometimes teens don't want to betray their friend's trust by learning a parent or a counselor, so they stay silent. But we think that this bill could provide a very easy way for a teen who's struggling to raise a red flag to their community. Will there be abuse of the bill? Of course, just like six days, just like sick days there may be rare occurrence, uh, occasions of abuse, but we cannot let that supersede the number of lives that will be saved. Mental health days are a very powerful tool and they are able to quickly send a message of, I am struggling and may need assistance. Since it does set off a chain of events from the counselors, including evaluation, and since there is still some stigma with mental health, especially with boys, I believe students who really need these days will take them. Most kids I know don't even want to miss uh, school when they're feeling ill, so we believe this is a powerful tool that will catch the early stages of, of a child suffering from mental health issues. We believe this bill will not only teach kids at a young age how to take care of themselves and practice self-care and self-management, but it could literally save lives. Now students from multiple other states are also trying to pass these laws. We believe students everywhere deserve a chance to feel better. The core concept is that physical and mental health are equal and should be treated as such. In fact, they are connected. Take healthcare, for example, CPR. If you had training, you could save someone's life. How about mental health care? I was trained in seventh grade in CPR in my health class. And so what if I was trained in seventh grade on how to ha handle my mental health or how to respond to a mental health crisis with my friends? I'd love to see a world where we have a toolkit of how to help a friend or a family member or even a stranger through a mental health crisis. These resources should especially be available in schools because that's where children are struggling the most. We hope you agree that it's always okay to not be okay and that it's okay to take a break. Just like we take a sick day, we should have a mental health day to replenish and nourish our mental health. It could be the difference of saving a life. I would like to very much encourage you to watch the TED Talk by Haley Hardcastle. It's such a powerful message and we believe it'll save children's lives. Will there be, while there will be abuse with the bill, we must remember the importance and effect of it on the teens who truly need it. Please help look after the teens in our life, especially the ones who look like they have it all together and look after yourself too. And once in a while, take a break. We support SB 249 and we are extremely grateful to send Do uh, Senator Don Darrow Loop for bringing this bill to our state legislature for consideration. Thank you all for your time and allowing us to tell our story. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you very much. And did you have anything else, Senator, or are you open for questions? No, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll start out. I just had a question. I believe either you or the presenters made a comment that a mental health day would alert the counselors. And I just, we, if you could just reference that part. Thank you very much. Uh, Marilyn Dondero Loop for the record. Um, usually when students are uh, taking days and multiple days, 
that's a red flag in a school of some sort. Um, and so a, kid, a lot of times they'll call students into the counselor's office, as well as if a student has been in the counselor's office. So um, what we're hoping with this is that we'll allow somebody besides just the general physician, in other words, the counselor that they're seeing in the school, uh, a counselor, a professional counselor that they may be seeing out of the school, whoever they're seeing to be able to write that note because right now the only way to get excused is with a general physician's note. Thank you for that clarification. Members, do Assemblywoman Torres and Assemblywoman Miller. So that will go in that order. Thank you, Senator, for the presentation. Uh, and thank you to the young women that co-presented the piece of legislation. I really do appreciate the intent of the bill, but I do, I, I'm just wondering, um, I have some concerns about how this would be put into place and what systems this would take. So I know in the classroom right now, if a student not wants to take a mental health day, they still have that ability to do so. Uh, and they would just, they would be absent. And what, essentially when the parent notifies the school, um, the, the parent, the, parent is able to then excuse their child. And so I understand now why you want them to maybe be something in the system that labels it a mental health day so that we're aware of that. However, I'm just wondering what, what that looks like because not only would that be an additional like type of day that they have absence for, and then we're gonna say that, that you know, they would be excused from the rating system for the accountability wouldn't be applicable for mental health days, but it's applicable. I've had many students that have had terminal illnesses um, and, and those students, that, that their absences do still impact our star rating. So I'm just not understanding why it would be applicable to one and not the other. Um, and I don't see anything in this legislation requiring counselors to follow up with students after a mental health day. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can kind of speak to that. Thank you, Marilyn Dondero Loop for the record. Um, you're right, you know, this bill does, it doesn't encompass everything in a school. So this is the mental health piece of that. You're right, students take days for a lot of different reasons. But what we wanted to do in this bill was to make sure that if students were considering um, ending their lives or had some severe mental health problems, that they had, in a way, permission to take those days. We know that there are many students that are sick but these days also would be so that students could feel safe and not harm themselves. And I think that's a really important piece in this uh, pandemic and in this day and time. Um, it, it, the reason it would not hopefully harm their, um, their uh, star rating is because we all know, as you just mentioned, that the star rating is based on absences. And so perhaps that's another bill at another time. This is just focused on the mental health today. I'm gonna follow up with my February chair. I, I'm just concerned that this might decrease the amount of students receiving services on campus um, because they would stay home. And I know, you know, at my school um, and at the schools that I've worked at in the past, when we have a student um, that, that is in crisis, oftentimes they not only do they speak to their teachers or their friends about it, and that's kind of the flag for us, and if they weren't on campus, we wouldn't be able to respond, we wouldn't be able to get them services, we wouldn't be able to ensure that they have that counselor and they have this support system. Um, and, and so I, I, I'm just concerned that maybe um, this is not the way for us to achieve that goal. I, I'm very much in agreement with your goal and ensuring that students have access to taking those days as necessary, but I believe that they currently do have that ability um, and, and I'm concerned with them not being in school to get those services and the help they need. Thank you very much. Marilyn Dondero Loop for the record. I'm, uh, I'm willing to take uh, that chance with this bill to help kids. Uh, we had four kids in DeMonte Ranch High School in Reno in within three months, I think it was, that completed a suicide. And so you know what? If I can save those four kids with this bill, I'm willing to do that. And while I recognize what you're saying, that the kids might not be on campus, I, I encourage you to watch the TED Talk by Haley Hardcastle. It's a pretty powerful story. And just a quick follow-up. It's not that I don't, think, I, I don't want to help kids. I just want to make sure kids get the mental health support that they need. And I think that we do that on schools. Um, and so I, I'm concerned um, that they might not get that support. And I just want to make sure that what, what, whatever legislation we pass ensures that the students are getting the support that they need on campus. Go ahead, Vice Chair. 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator, for this. I um, have some, some questions about um, it, maybe the way it's drafted, because I do fully understand the intent, but maybe the way it's drafted. And uh, my colleague did bring up some, some questions already. Um, first, I absolutely love the part about it not impacting the star ratings of the schools. I, I think that that is um, very critical and would love to, as my colleague said, and maybe this could be amended, but I think with health along, you know, any of these excused absences, uh, you know, because again, we, we do have students that will be out for months and months for, you know, physical reasons too. So I think that that should open a bigger conversation that these things shouldn't be held against schools when, when a student is in a hospital for three months or terminal or home or, or going through, um, you know, any, any type of treatment. So I, I love that part. But now from the discussion, from what the co-presenter said and what you said and what the bill says, originally the way the bill's written, it looks like, it, it, it reads as if, a student, whether there's a crisis going on or they just need um, so, some mental health time or services, the way I interpreted it was that, okay, the parent can call in and say, you know, I'm gonna keep them home for the next couple of days um, for, for whatever mental health related issue. But then during the conversation, it sounds a little bit more like, more like the school could invoke it. Like if the school or the counselor, um, or maybe the kids that kind of what I started picturing as the co-presenters were speaking is, you know, going down to the counseling office, maybe something happened or we know often kids tell, every, you know, their, their problems at school. And then, so at that point they're, you know, they hang out all day in the counseling office. They just can't go back to class that day. So my first question is, how do you envision that it would actually be invoked from the parent and the student or the school? And then my other concern, and I wonder about this because currently now, parents can call and just excuse their kids. You know, I'm keeping them home and no reason and there's no difference between excused and unexcused. It's the parents call and it's fine. But I'm just wondering kind of with FERPA, if I now as a parent call and I, I, you know, not all parents want to give that information necessarily to the school. And I just wonder if there's any concern or with that, because I may just want to say, hey, I'm keeping my kid home for the next three days, or, you know, they're not coming to school. I may not want to always divulge. And I feel like at this point, now divulging that there is a mental health. Do you, I'm sure you follow my questions, right, Senator? <laughs> I, I, I know you follow me. Marilyn Don Loop for the record. Um, I would say any and all of the above, but I envision it is, is and I, I believe this is the intent of the bill, is that if I went, if a student came to me as a counselor and I thought they needed a day and, and by the way, many times these are our very, very high-end kids. These aren't just kids that are at risk all the time. These are all kids. It crosses lines everywhere. And if a student came to me as a counselor, I might call a parent and say, I think they just need a day home, right? And the one day home, I mean, not 10, one. Um, but also the fact that they would need a, a note I mean, this isn't just a parent calling and saying, oh, yeah, I'm keeping my kid home. These three days will be sort of isolated out and being mental health days. And so if they are used, you would need a physician, you would need a psychologist, you would need a counselor, you would need someone of record to say that that student needs that mental health day. And, we'll, and, and, and by the way, we'll, like I said before, I mean, there will be abuses. There's abuses with the 10-day system. There's abuses all the time. But I'm willing to chance those abuse, abuses to save these kids. Follow-up, Chair? So thank you for that, Senator, because I think that kind of clarifies a little bit for me. So you would also, because, again, the way the bill's written, 
it talks about a qualified physician um, and behavioral health. So you're saying that a school counselor could also be, that I don't, as a parent, need to just take my child to a therapist or a doctor and get a letter. It can also be invoked by the school counselor that they would count under, the, un, under that umbrella of who could invoke it. Because the bill just says, like a qualified physician. So it, that's why it seems very one-sided, one that it starts from the home, as opposed to it can also start at the school. Well, I think any time, Marilyn Dondero Loop, for the record, any time you have children involved that are under 18, you have to have a parent involved. So I, I don't think there's a, there's not a big choice there. You have to have a parent, a guardian, a grandparent. You have to have somebody involved that is the adult taking care of that child. Uh, follow up. I just want to make sure that, you know, the separation between uh, legislation and the interpretation of implementation, that it's clarified that it would be that a school psychologist, a school counselor, a principal, anybody that was, you know, that they could also invoke it. In the example that you said, you know, I'm going to call the parent, they're having a real hard time or this happened, you know, can you come get them? I think they just need the day. And again, that not counting against them. Because I don't think it's real clear in the bill. So, so section, section two, subsection two says a certificate, which means a note, in writing from any qualified physician, mental health professional, or behavioral health professional acting within his or her authorized scope of practice. It does not say principal, does not say teacher. It says health professional, mental health professional, and behavioral health professional. So does that cover school counselor? I believe that the mental health professional would, but I would check that to make sure. I've not had anybody question that. Um, certainly our counselors, our mental health professionals, our psychologists on our campuses are, you know, mental health professionals. So, I mean, I, I'm not an attorney and I'm not legal here at LCB, but I certainly feel like they would uh, be under that scope of practice. But once again, they would not be able to do that without talking to the parent. It's different if I take my child to a outside therapist, for example, for counseling, and that counselor says something, I'm already involved. Okay, thank you. I don't think we have any other questions. I don't, um, I don't know if legal, if you want to. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Mertz at Committee Council. Uh, yes, yeah, so under subsection two, section two, um, a school counselor could be considered a mental health or behavioral health professional as long as they're you know, a mental health professional um, in that field. So a school counselor who may be like a social worker um, would fall under that category. Thank you very much. Okay, quick question from Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Senator, for being here. I'll try to make it quick. It's just, I, I understand this is a really heavy subject. I certainly appreciate what, what you're trying to do and probably could be supportive of it, but I'm, a few things are going through my mind. First of all, um, kids to have a mental health day, and I have not seen the TED Talk, and I, I, I promise I'll go watch that. Have a mental health day, I'm trying to see how this is gonna work if, if it's law. They can take a mental health day, we're keeping track of that, correct, at school, that this child had a mental health day versus their regular absence. When they take that mental health day, or days, are they immediately, are, is, are they at home with their R services? There's a plan going on. And, and if you don't mind, let me just throw this in real quick. Because I do know, I think kids need a break. I've had discussions before, you know, with my kids and, and our, we had kids before the advent of a lot of social media and those after. Sometimes in my day, I needed to stay home. We just had had it. Kids can be brats at school and treat you badly or whatever, and you're just, you're over it. You need a break. But now kids don't get away from that. So they go, here's my concern. I love the idea of a mental health break, but they're going to take that break, but they're not taking a break from, I think, what sometimes is a lot of the culprit is that social media. And I know you have no control over that. So I feel like we're trying to address it, 
and I think that's what you're going for, but I'm wondering about these other influence that they're still not getting away from the problem. So what are those services looking like when they take those mental health days? Uh, Marilyn Don Darrell, for the record, thank you very much for the question. Um, you know, if we could legislate parenting, then we would, but we can't. And so I think that when a child takes a mental health day, they've probably already once again, worked with a mental health professional, worked with a behavioral health professional, and we're, I, I would hope, and I would have every confidence that that person would give some parameters to what might need to be happening the day that that child takes that day. If they're seeing an outside counselor, they may very well be going to see that counselor on that day, um, or their doctor, their general physician. Um, certainly, we, um, all of us that are, you know, pre-social media, understand the influences of social media with children. Um, but we can't, we, there, there is no way for us in any bill that we write to legislate what happens inside a home with a phone or a computer. I mean, we can't. So could a mental health professional say to a parent, I would suggest that your child not be on the screen tomorrow and just really take a break, sure. But I, I can't go to your, I, I mean, unless something else is going on, I can't go to your house and see that that's happening. So I, I, I appreciate what you're asking, absolutely. Um, but I don't think that that's what, something we're trying to legislate in the here. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate what you're trying to do. And, and one, just one last thing. Are, have, have you had, and maybe they're going to testify um, later, have mental health of, um, professionals been involved in, in, in this legislation? Or yes. do we have examples of this in other states that have done it? Uh, Marilyn Dondero Loop, for the record. Yes, actually, uh, I have a whole file here. Um, Oregon passed a bill in 2019. Uh, Virginia passed a bill, um, Colorado, Florida, Washington. I mean, I've, I've got more information here. Indiana, Maine, Utah, uh, for, I think I mentioned Virginia and West Virginia, Wisconsin. I mean, uh, there are many, many states that have this legislation, absolutely. Okay, I am gonna do one final question from Assemblywoman Tolls. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and um, thanks for addressing this incredibly important issue. It's, it's always heartbreaking, and it's been particularly heartbreaking this past year, and I think we all share that, that same passion for protecting our kids. Um, I was just curious because I, I, um, I don't know that we addressed this, but in Section 1, you have here listing information on the back of the ID cards, and um, we had similar legislation, AB 167, that we passed out of our house that um, also addressed that and some of the things that came up in that discussion were including safe voice um, in that list of resources because we're really trying to you know direct our kids to that statewide resource um, the, a couple other things that came up was offering a text message option not just phone numbers and then the the third thing that came up was just the cost um, for some of our districts in in being able to put that on the back side of, a, of an ID card because I guess there's a district that doesn't have a printer that does both sides apparently. I'm just wondering if you've had a chance to talk with the school districts about that piece and NDE. Thank you. Marilyn Don Darrell for the record, yes. Um, and uh, I believe Clark County is either already in the queue to do that they'd have to speak to that i forget what they said it's been it's been a couple months few months ago when i had that conversation with them but almost all school districts i mean maybe somebody like esmeralda but those kids in high school go don't go to school right there so i'm trying to think of what high school wouldn't have id cards that would be the pictures from life touch or whatever and those are the companies that will they, those are the companies that make the student ID cards anyway, and this information will be on the back of that student ID card. And yes, you're absolutely right. It, it does say telephone number here, but the, the idea is, is that there would be uh, safe voice information um, that students could get a hold of. Uh, very similar to when 
you use a public restroom anywhere on the back of the door, there is always information about sex trafficking hotlines. And so this would be on student ID cards, safe voices and suicide hotline information. Okay, we are um, gonna move on to testimony in support. Um, I didn't discuss our, what we do, but uh, you guys are probably familiar with it at this point. We will allow equal time for support, opposition, and neutral. Um, so we'll start out by asking if there's anyone in the room who would like to testify. Mr. Daly, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association, uh, here uh, in support of SB 249. Um, I think uh, the conversation here in the committee and the c clear concern uh, for uh, student mental health is warranted and very appreciated. Uh, and in particular, uh, our leadership is appreciative of the language in section two, subsection four, uh, which uh, states that uh, one of these excused absences uh, related to behavioral health uh, shall not uh, count against the school in the uh, in SPF or the, the system of uh, school accountability. Uh, when it does, it, it gives to schools this counter incentive to support, uh, in this case, the, the mental health of students uh, when schools guard against uh, these types of uh, dings uh, on their reports. So we appreciate that language. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else in the room that would like to testify? I don't see anyone walking up. And I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom. So BPS, do we have any callers who are in support of the bill? To testify in support on SB 249, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in support on Senate Bill 249, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, at this time, we have no callers to testify in support on Senate Bill 249. Thank you, BPS. And with that, we will close the testimony in support and open testimony in opposition. Is there anyone in the room? Anyone on the Zoom? BPS, is there anyone on the line in opposition? To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 249, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in opposition on Senate Bill 249, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the line is open and working, but we have no callers to testify in opposition on Senate Bill 249. Thank you, BPS. And with that, I will close the testimony in opposition and open the testimony in the neutral position. We have someone approaching. Please begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Przinski, here representing Nevada Association of school superintendents. And there are parts of SB 249 that we really appreciate the fact that the additional days uh, won't impact the star rating for schools we think is important. The, uh, also the fact that the uh, information on the back of the uh, card, uh, the ID card, we think most of the districts can accommodate that and that may uh, be of uh, extra help to some students. This is a very important issue. There's no question about that. The uh, issue that we do, or the thing that we're trying to work on right now are the mechanics of carrying out the um, dictates of the bill. So we're in the neutral position as we continue to work with our sponsor who has been a champion for education for many years. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brzezinski. Um, anyone on the Zoom? Okay. BPS, do we have any callers in the neutral position? To testify in the neutral position on Senate Bill 249, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. 
Once again, to testify in the neutral position on Senate Bill 249, please press star nine now. Chair, the line is open and working. However, we have no callers to testify in the neutral position on Senate Bill 249. Thank you, VPS and Senator Dondero Loop. Did you have any closing remarks? Okay, with that, we will close the hearing on SB 249 and we will open the hearing on SB 151. Welcome back. Good afternoon again, Chair Bill Bray Axelrod and members of the committee. For the record, I am Marilyn Dondero Loop representing Senate District 8 in Clark County, and I'm pleased to present Senate Bill 151 for your consideration today, which builds upon our previous efforts to increase the number of specialized personnel in our public schools. The personnel I am focusing on today are the behavioral and mental health professionals who work in our schools counselors, psychologists, and social workers. To this end, last session, we required the State Board of Education to examine best practices for staffing and develop non-binding recommendations for the ratio of pupils for each of these specialized personnel groups. These professionals bring their, to their position years of education and training. They are dedicated to ensuring that all students in Nevada have access to quality education and to the support they need to grow, learn, and feel safe. Yet they are often working, subject to working conditions that limit their opportunity to provide services to Nevada's public school children. For example, counselors are trained to assist students with academic and career planning and personal and social development. But due to staffing shortages, their duties are often focused on administering standardized tests, supervising lunchrooms, acting as substitute teachers, and making attendance phone calls. Similarly, school psychologists are experts in education and psychology. They are qualified mental health professionals who work with students in crisis. They have specialized training to improve the school climate as a prevention measure. They are able to develop prevention strategies in mental health, substance abuse, bullying, and delinquency. However, they are, most, they are most often assigned to assess children for special education services and develop individual edu individualized education plans. School social workers are licensed by the Board of Examiners for Social Workers. They are trained to implement small group intervention strategies and identify more intensive interventions for individual students. They target multiple risk factors in home, school, and community settings and identify warning signs of violent behavior. They also work to provide support for a crisis. What do school counselors, psychologists, and social workers have in common? They are qualified mental health professionals who are often underutilized for their primary purpose in our public schools. In addition, Nevada's public schools are understaffed in these professions. Even the United States Department of Education listed all three areas as experiencing shortages in personnel. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, even before the coronavirus disease of 2019, approximately one in six children in the United States experience mental health disorder each year. And the National Association of School Psychologists estimates that up to 60% of students do not receive the treatment they need. Data shows that it is critical to reach these students when they are young as more than half of mental health challenges begin before the age of 14. According to the Education Commission of the States, federal data suggests that school counselors, psychologists, and school social workers might confront overwhelming caseloads as the pandemic continues. I think we all recognize that COVID-19 pandemic has significantly increased the demand for the services of our school counselors, psychologists, and social workers. The impact of isolation due to remote learning has magnified the urgent concerns about student safety and well-being. And I think we can all agree that we need this group of trained professionals now more than ever. In a 2020 statewide plan for the improvement of pupils, the State Board of Education recommended the following non-binding best practice ratios. For school counselors, one per 250 pupils. For school psychologists, one per 500 to 700 pupils and for school social workers, one per 250 pupils. 
Needless to say, Nevada does not have the personnel needed to meet those staffing ratios. Most alarming, our current ratios of school-based mental health professionals to students are four to five times greater than the national recommended ratios. The data provided in the report by the State Department of Education concludes that statewide, we would need an additional 819 counselors, 649 school psychologists, and 1,395 social workers. Now that we know the scope of the problem, I will go over the bill so that we can talk about next steps. Senate Bill 151 contains two major components to address these next steps. The first of these contained in Section 1 of the bill. The Board of Trustees in the Nevada's largest school districts, Clark and Washoe, are required to develop a plan to accomplish two objectives. The plan should describe how the district will improve the ratio of pupils to this group of personnel in order to achieve the ratios recommended by the State Board of Education. And the plan must also include strategies to recruit and retain the counselors, psychologists, and social workers, as well as establishing annual targets for meeting the recommended ratios for these workers. The two districts must submit a report to the Nevada Department of Ed concerning their plan to improve these ratios and the effectiveness of its re efforts to recruit and retain the behavioral and mental health professionals. The report must also describe what the district plans to do during the next school year to meet the targeted ratios. The Nevada Department of Ed is then required to compile this information and submit it to the governor, the legislature, and the state board. The second major component of Senate Bill 151 may be found in Section 2 of the bill. The licensing board for our educators, the Commission on Professional Standards and Education, is required to establish continuing education requirements specific to school counselors and school psychologists. In a similar manner, the Board of Examiners for Social Workers is required to establish continuing education requirements for school social workers. Currently, most of these professionals participate in continuing ed opportunities as part of their commitment to their profession but receive no state level credit. This section of the bill will address that oversight. I'm hopeful by taking these next steps with our largest school districts, it will focus the attention on these critical roles these professionals provide for our schools. It also moves Nevada towards being nationally recognized best practices. And I'm especially hopeful that this focus will help school districts recruit and retain more mental health professionals. Now I would like to invite um, Dr. Katherine Dockweiler, who uh, serves on the State Board of Education and is a nationally certified school psychologist and policy researcher committed to the improvement of the education system. And I hope she's there. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Oh, there she is. Yay. Go ahead, Ms. or Dr. Dockweiler. Welcome back to the committee. Thank you, Senator Dondera Luke. Good afternoon, Chair Bill Bray Axelrod and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Katie Dockweiler and I'm speaking to you today as a school psychologist and the Director of Government and Professional Relations for the Nevada Association of School Psychologists. I would like to provide some historic context with regard to the provisions outlined in this bill. The work toward improving staffing ratios for school-based mental health providers began in 2018 with the statewide school safety task force. As a member of that group, we were tasked with finding systemic long-term solutions to improving student well-being and safety in Nevada. Presentations were made by national and local experts, statewide data were carefully reviewed, and high impact, high efficacy targets were chosen. Establishing staffing ratios for Nevada's school-based mental health providers, as well as developing a strategic plan for successfully achieving those ratios were determined to be two foundational targets to ultimately improve the mental and behavioral health services available to our students. These provisions were passed in 2019 under Senate Bill 89. Since 2019, a collaborative of stakeholder groups have been working closely to explore best practice ratios within each professional domain, along with a variety of potential avenues for attaining these ratios. This collaborative has included the state associations for school psychologists, school counselors, and school social workers, the Nevada Department of Education, and other related professional organizations. With the first foundational component now passed and recommended ratios established, it is time for the second foundational component, the strategic plans, to be developed and carried out by districts to further support growth towards achieving these ratios. 
The steps outlined by Senator Dondero Loop are essential for continued progress toward improving student well being and safety. Specific measurable targets for recruitment and retention will help districts determine if their efforts are having the desired impact and will allow opportunity to shift efforts in a timely manner. If staffing goals are not set and progress not measured intentionally and at regular intervals, we will never know if we are on track to achieving our goals. Now more than ever, our students need access to school-based mental health providers, and this bill will help achieve that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Members, do we have questions? Okay, so I know um, Assemblywoman Wynn, and then we'll go to Assemblywoman Hansen, and then I saw someone over here. It's Assemblywoman Tolls. I almost said Torres. <laughs> All right, so please go ahead, uh, Assemblywoman Wynn. Thank you. Um, my question is in section one. Um, I see that it looks like it's the school districts that are required to submit these plans to NDE. Is there any reason why NDE isn't responsible for this or it's not a collaborative effort between the two of those to determine that kind of responsibility? Thank you very much for the question, Marilyn Dondero Loop for the record. The Board of Trustees in each school district in those large counties um, whose population is 100,000 or more, as you can see by the bill, are asked to develop that plan, and then that plan will be submitted, and um, I believe there will be some disaggregation of that data together with the Nevada Department of Education. Chair, may I follow up? Yes. So is it, is it, it is an ACE, is it, for NDE to ultimately create like a statewide plan or is it just for these individual school boards or this individual like areas to do their own localized plans? Thank you very much. Marilyn Don Darrell Loop for the record. Um, in section two, subsection two, you'll see the commission shall adopt the regulations uh, establishing continuing education requirements. Um, and that, that also will be part of this plan that comes out of the school board. So they, they will be like localized and not yes. like statewide? Uh, yes. Thank you. Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of questions. It, could I have you, um, Senator, I think it was you that, re that just repeat the ratios. I think you said the first one was one to 250. Was that for counselors? And then the rest of them. And then the, so, uh, the school psychologist and, and the social worker ones. Sorry to put you on the spot there. That's I okay. A lot I just had paper. to go back in my notes. Thank sure. you for the question. Marilyn Dondero, for the record, in 2020, the statewide plan for improvement of pupils, the State Board of Education recommended the following non-binding best practice ratios. For school counselors, it was one per 250 pupils. For school psychologists, it was one per 500 to 700 pupils. And for school social workers, one, for 200, one per 250 pupils. Thank you. And then um, also, it, the, I think this will go to doc, Dr. Doc Waller, doc Weiler. Thank you for being here. Um, so hearing those ratios, and then I think it was mentioned that, that we would, you know, in total, we have, we'd, we'd need 800 counselors, 649 psychologists, 1395 on the social workers. Knowing that in the psychology private practice realm in Nevada, we run very low on, on licensed psychologists in our state. Do we see a problem trying to, we know what the need is, Kind of like with teachers, we know what the need is, but are we going to have trouble finding them to hire and have them qualified um, to, to be in the schools? It, and either of you could answer that. I Thank you very much for the question. Dr. Doc Weiler, would you like to address that, please? Sure. Thank you, Senator Don Darlow. Um, to address your question, yes, we do have a shortage of mental health providers in the community and within schools. Our hope within the school setting is to create, similar to what we've developed with our teacher pipelines, to create school-based mental health pipelines so that we can begin um, getting individuals into the profession in the educational setting and then work them through a supported network to, um, to make our 
our workforce more robust and to increase our pipeline of school-based mental health providers to ultimately ensure licensure in uh, either school psychology, school counseling, or school social work. Thank you so much. And, and I, Marilyn Don Darrell Loop, for the record, and just to add to that, the, Section 1, Section, Subsection 1, uh, A, is those are the, that is part of the whole overall plan is strategies to recruit and retain. So thank you very much for the question. Assemblywoman Toltz. You caught yourself for just a minute. I heard that. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and thank you, of course. And it's wonderful to see you, um, uh, Dr. Um, it's just it's just great to be back here on this this topic because as you know we worked really closely together on these um, this effort back in 2018 and I'm glad to see the work continue and I'm glad to see this bill come forward and um, you know because we are nowhere near there yet right and so I also wanted to um, you know piggyback on some of the things that Assemblywoman Hansen said that um, I think it's really important to make sure that we are engaging with our higher ed community on this so that we are building that pipeline and and I appreciated the answer because that was going to be my question is how are we doing that and I know that's in there in section one subsection one but just um, uh, it's probably good enough just to get it on the record uh, I don't know if we actually have to add it to the text of the bill but I think it is incredibly important because we've got to build up that pipeline for sure. My question was more specific to section two and um, in regards to the continuing ed and more just out of curiosity, um, because don't we already have continuing education for school counselors and school psychologists, or is this something new? I, I had just always assumed that we had that same continuing ed requirements like we would for anyone else in the mental health field. Thank you. Marilyn Don Darrell loop the record. I'm, I'm going to give about one sentence and then I'll have Dr. Dockweiler because this is her wheelhouse, so to speak, uh, jump in there. But yes, um, we do have continuing ed, but many uh, times our mental health workers don't get credit for that. So I'm going to let Dr. Dockweiler take that one. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Katie Dockweiler, for the record. I believe the intent behind this portion is to align uh, state level requirements with what we are required to obtain nationally. So for example, there are certain requirements that I need to meet every three years as a nationally certified school psychologist. So aligning those requirements with our state level requirements so that we're not creating uh, a duplicate system or, or creating just making sure there's an alignment between national best practice and what's required in state for each of those three professions. Thank you. Follow up, Chair. Um, okay. So, and maybe this is just um, for follow up beyond this this hearing. But um, I just would be curious to know how many how many hours, and you know who's going to teach. Just just the implementing side of that, practically speaking, um, just to make sure we don't run into a roadblock for implementation. Where you know we've put this in statute, and we just want to make sure that we've got that process in place to meet them on the other side. So um, feel free to follow up with me afterwards, but that, that's the nature of my questions there. Thank you. Uh, committee members, any other questions? Okay. Uh, we will move on to testimony and support. Is there anyone in the room? Welcome, Mr. Daly. Welcome back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association, the voice of Nevada educators for over 120 years. NSCA is in support of the goals of SB 151 to reduce the caseloads of licensed educators, such as school counselors, psychologists, and social workers, while also providing meaningful professional development. Common Sense tells us reasonable caseloads for uh, other licensed education professionals are significant in helping students succeed. That is why NSCA has been supportive of efforts across legislative sessions to address the issue of unreasonable caseloads for specialized instructional support personnel. We applaud Senator Dondera Loop for continuing her efforts to address this issue uh, this session. 
Senate Bill 89 from the last session directed the State Board of Education to develop recommendations for the ratio of students to specialized instructional support professional uh, personnel based on national best practices. The board recommended one school counselor and one school social worker per, per 250 pupils and one school psychologist per 500 pupils. Current caseloads are far from these recommended uh, targets as of 2020. Nevada's ratios were 1 to 463 for counselors, 1 to 1,843 for psychologists, and 1 to 1,174 for social workers. Uh, while much of this work rose out of school safety concerns, the COVID-19 pandemic and impact on schools and kids has further elevated the importance of counselors, psychologists, and social workers in school communities. Students returning to school buildings this year found systems to support their mental health and social and emotional needs totally overburdened. Nevada schools are in desperate need of more highly trained counselors, psychologists, and social workers. With starting pay and benefits averaging between $62,000 and $77,000 per year, recruitment and retention in these rigorous fields is very uh, difficult. Uh, that is why NSCA has been uh, talking about uh, treating these occupations similarly to teachers who have become nationally board certified with a 5% salary enhancement. Uh, we realized that uh, earlier in the session, uh, this was a bit of a non-starter with the state's uh, budget situation. We think with this week's uh, economic forum uh, projections that perhaps uh, this legislature could uh, find these funds for this in this budget. Uh, if so, this would help with recruitment and retention while also incentivizing school counselors, psychologists, and social workers to achieve the highest standards uh, in their profession. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daly. Anyone else in the room? And no one on the Zoom. Uh, BPS, if we could take the first caller in support. To testify in support of SB 151, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 498, please state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Erica Valdrez, E-R-I-C-A-V-A-L-D-R-I-Z, -E with the Vegas Chamber. The Chamber is in support of SB 151. The Chamber supports having a high-quality, comprehensive school counseling program in our state. We believe that the count of students who are enrolled in distance learning because of Nevada students, um, they deserve the best support and benefits from our school system. The Chamber cares about this program because it supports student achievement, which will increase Nevada's graduation rate. With necessary supports in place, school counselors and school psychologists are uniquely equipped to promote academic success and help Nevada students become college ready or career ready. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for your time. We urge your support for this bill. Thank you for your testimony. Next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits of 023, please state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, committee chairwoman Bill Bray Axelrod and committee members. My name is Dr. Brenda Pearson, B-R-E-N-D-A-P-E-A-R-S-O-N, and I'm here representing the Clark County Education Association. CCEA supports Senate Bill 151 and thanks Senator Dondero Loop for working with us on this bill. This bill ensures that every school district reflects upon progress made to get to the long-term goal of state board recommended ratios for mental and behavioral health professionals. This bill also includes accountability measures to ensure that districts develop and follow a plan that contains strategies to recruit and retain mental and behavioral health professionals. Currently, our school psychologists, counselors, and school social workers have already dealt with high professional to student ratios. With the anticipated rise of mental and behavioral health issues due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it is incredibly important to have accountability measures in place to make sure that our long-term goals can be met and that we can be agile in our approach to creating pipelines for mental health professionals in education. It is clear that a reduction in caseloads from our mental health professionals will lead to increased student success in academics and will help to develop the social and emotional growth factor linked to academic success. 
Though the ultimate goal of this bill projects us 15 years into the future, the reporting mechanism in this bill will ensure that we keep our eye on the target and achieve our goals. When looking at the cost of mental and behavioral health in K-12 education, known as wraparound services, we must understand that this is a specified area that federal COVID-19 pandemic relief funds can be utilized. In addition to the full implementation and funding of the pupil-centered funding plan, it is imperative that we as stakeholders impacted communities and legislators commit to the fact that our students need us today. We cannot wait for another legislative session to create, implement, strengthen, and fund these services. Mental health, just like education, is not just a talking point. Located in the exhibits in Nellis are 10 comments in support from mental and behavioral health specialists in CCSD who cannot be here today because they are on the clock. Now it's your turn to make sure that we do all of our part to ensure that every student can have the recommended ratio of mental and behavioral health professional to student to ensure that their achievement and outcomes are top priority. CCA thanks every stakeholder for their effort and looks forward to supporting the development of mental health supports in K-12. Thank you for your testimony. BPS, are there any other callers in support? Chair, the line is open and working, but we have no further callers in support of SB 151 at this time. Thank you. With that, I will close testimony in support and move to testimony in opposition. I don't see anyone coming up, and I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom. So, BPS, um, do you have any callers in opposition? To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 151, Please press star nine now to play, take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in opposition on Senate Bill 151, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the line is open and working, but we have no callers to testify in opposition on SB 151. Thank you, BPS, and we will close testimony in opposition and open testimony in the neutral position. Do we have anyone here? No? Okay. And no one on the Zoom. BPS, is there any callers who are in neutral? To testify in the neutral position on Senate Bill 151, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Once again, if you wish to testify in the neutral position on SB 151, please press star 9 now. Chair, the line is open and working. However, we have no callers to testify in the neutral position on SB 151 at this time. Thank you, BPS. And uh, Senator, did you have any closing comments? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Just really quickly in closing, it's clear that our K-12 students face many social, emotional, and situational pressures that affect their school performance. And unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified those pressures and school safety concerns will not magically disappear when students return to the classroom. We should have available mental health professionals in our schools who can work individually and collectively to create school environments that encourage growth and enable children to feel school is a safe place for them and those essential support services provided by each of these professional groups all contribute to this environment and we must do better to ensure that we help them to meet the needs of our students. If I have learned one thing in this building with my many terms is that you have to start somewhere. And so while both of these bills may not be all encompassing and may not be everything that we want, if we don't start somewhere, we wait another two years to start somewhere and then we don't start somewhere again. So I urge your support. Thank you very much. And thank you for your time today, committee. Thank you, Senator. And with that, we will close the hearing on SB 151. And we will open the hearing on SB 193. I see Senator Hardy is here. Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Education. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good to be here with you. I uh, am thrilled to be able to have uh, the opportunity to stand up for vets. Uh, in full disclosure, I am one. 
but uh, this uh, particular bill dealing with education on the Education Committee is an opportunity that we have to show our support for vets and uh, I say vets because I can't spell veterans. Um, so Senate Bill 193 uh, requires the Board of Regents of the University of Nevada to submit to the legislature a report concerning student veterans and also requires the board to give preference in admission to certain veterans in each nursing program and program for the education of its teachers. Now, having said that, in preference, you still as a veteran have to qualify uh, for the program. You, you cannot go into a program that you don't qualify for, but if you have two people, one is a veteran, one is not, and they're both equally qualified, uh, but qualified, then the veteran would have that preference. Um, so it, it also removes the time limitation for matriculating in the Nevada system of higher education for set, certain veterans. Um, and the timeline is interesting uh, because it used to be, I think, five years, and now we're proposing uh, removing that limitation because veterans come back to school not necessarily right away. And they also, their children and their spouses uh, may not even be old enough yet to come back. And so one of the challenges that we have is making sure that veterans, uh, survivors, have an opportunity to go to college. Um, and that's one of the reasons for that. Um, it, and I, I think I have uh, Ross Bryant, who may or may not be on Zoom, but he uh, testified in the Senate and probably will have that opportunity in this time too. Um, the um, spouses and dependents using 9-11 uh, educational assistance uh, can go tuition free. So there, it prohibits the assessment of tuition charges against veteran spouses and dependents using the 9-11 educational assistance and prohibits the assessment of tuition charges against students using the survivors and dependents educational uh, assistance. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or confuse you with my answers. Did you want to, um, we do have somebody else to testify? That'd be great. I think that's, <laughs> yeah, save me. Wonder, I think we have someone on Zoom. If you are there, if you could turn on your camera and begin when you're ready. They're on, but, oh, here we go. Nope, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Bryant, to uh, Assembly Committee on Education and begin when you're ready. Yes, my name is Ross Bryan, and I'm the executive director of the Veterans Office. I'm very honored to be in support of the bill presented by uh, Senator Hardy uh, that would help with in-state tuition for any family member or veteran that has in-state tuition or would be charged out-of-state tuition. The current law, uh, if you get here after a five-year period, you would be charged out-of-state. So the federal government has just recently passed the law, and this law would put us in compliance with the federal law to where any of these veterans, their benefit is now good forever. It does not expire in 15 years. So some veterans that have family members might choose to go to work to raise their children and go to school later. That means if they came to UNLV later, they would not be charged out of state tuition. We also have over 300 family members at UNLV that have their parents benefit because they extended their service during 20 years of this war uh, and have benefits that their parents had, and that would also extend to them so that they have in-state tuition also. This would also include what's called Chapter 35. Uh, any veteran that's 100% disabled, um, their children get a stipend, and this bill would also ensure that they get in-state tuition because a lot of those kids traveled the globe and moved every couple of years with their parents so they probably did not attend high school in Nevada unless they were stationed at Nelson, the Air Force. So this bill is very uh, instrumental in helping 
to number one, bring more veterans and military family members to uh, the Enchi system here at Nevada. And is that your testimony? <laughs> yes, that is. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if you were just collecting your thoughts. Um, okay, committee, do we have questions? You have a question for your dad? <laughs> Assemblyman Hardy. Yes, thank you, Chair. It is good to see you, Dad. <laughs> um, so uh, my question is just about the report. Is So the Board of Regents, the report, do they have to um, break it down by institution or is it just an overall of all the institutions for the different categories listed here? So as I understand it, it's for the whole system uh, because it's, it's a system issue. Um, and as I understand it also that we will get that report as well. The Legislative Committee on Education will get that as well as the director of legislative council bureau so either or we're, we're going to see that as well as the the report uh, and i think that's important for us to know you know where we're at and what we can predict and what we can plan for agreed so we're not out of the loop <laughs> agreed i'm just i was just surprised kind of that they don't already re um, have some kind of report but i i'm sure they already collect the information now it's just putting it into one report, as you said, the legislature will see it and we know like what's going on with veterans. And Thank if you. I may, Madam Chair, the uh, Ross Bryan, I think is probably intimately involved with those numbers. And uh, I mean, that's part of his life and he may want to uh, chime in here. Uh, yes, Senator Hardy. So currently, um, all of the NG schools already do an annual veteran report from AB 76. And so that report would continue. Um, I think the tracking of in-state tuition would be added to that annual report. Whereas before we didn't report, report on that, we reported on numbers and uh, programming and graduation rates and retention. So uh, that report is already happening. It would just be enhanced with the requirements from this new bill. Thank you for that. And um, I, I just wanted to say I this bill came out of um, a subcommittee or an interim committee that I happen to be the vice chair of. And so I'm very happy that this bill made it through. We did have a similar bill from doc, um, Dr. Titus over here. I'm do, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, I'm familiar with Dr. Titus. How's that? <laughs> Are you familiar with the bill that does something similar? I'm, I'm willing to learn. Okay. I don't think that there is any conflict, and if there is, we can let legal figure that out. But um, just wanted you to be aware. But I, I, I think the language should be okay. But it is, they are similar, as does happen in this building a lot. So, um, all right. Any other questions? Up. Oh, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I've been chatty today. Hello, Senator. It's good to see you. Um, appreciate the bill. I want to make sure I'm understanding something. Um, when it, we talk about in section uh, one, or no, I'm sorry, section three, a board of regents shall require each nursing program in the system to give preference in the mission to veterans of the armed forces. And then also, um, I think that was it. Um, I want to understand what it means by preference because some of those programs are very competitive and believe me this is I, my mom I'm a nurse mom of nurses who weren't military and I'm a mom of several military so I'm trying to see because those programs are so competitive particularly I know that Orvis at UNR is when we say preference if there is a choice between a veteran applicant and a non-veteran applicant do they open up an extra spot or they're going to compete for the same spot? Thank you, Madam Chair, if I may. Uh, the, there is a qualification that you have to have in order to go to nursing school. So this does not uh, open up a spot. It only allows if two people 
are equally qualified, then it goes to the veteran. It does not say the veteran has preference over everybody no matter what. It does not do that. So this is just a two people, one veteran, one not, equal qualifications, it goes to the veteran. Uh, An awkward silence. I'm sorry, I just... No, no, it was me. I probably should have... Uh, oh, that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> but I, I, I love our veterans, and they should have preference. Um, so I, I would maybe talk to you offline. I want to see if we do this in other states and some of the history behind it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Assemblywoman Tolls. Thank you, Chair. And actually, once again, Assemblywoman Hanson and I are thinking some of the same things. I also was going to ask about this section, um, and I do see it's section three is nursing and section four is teachers. And she asked my question about preferences, but my next question would be, Senator, um, why did we choose those specific degrees, nursing and teachers? Thank you. Joe Hardy, for the record. I. Um, I'm aware that there are veterans who want to be nurses and teachers, and obviously those are, uh, to Senator or Assemblywoman Hansen's point, is those are very competitive in uh, those programs. And so this is an attempt to uh, have the veteran have some opportunity, maybe that they wouldn't have otherwise, but they have to have the qualifications. So this is not to give them extra qualifications. This is to allow them with the same qualification to have uh, the veteran chosen. Thank you. So I think what I heard you say is that just it has to do with the competitiveness of those programs, not specifically because we're trying to, um, you know, those are areas where we, you know, it, those are competitive. I guess uh, let me follow up with. I'm so articulate today. Um, let me follow up with, I know engineering would also potentially be a natural fit, right, um, with a lot of our veterans coming out of the military and having some, some training in that particular area or other programs. Did you consider other programs or just nursing and teaching because they're particularly competitive? Thanks. Joe Hardy, for the record, just those programs were considered. I am a very amendment-friendly kind of guy. Um, so, but I do not know, I confess, I do not know the competitiveness or the drive that we have in the engineering program, for instance. Um, but that is, it's a, it's narrowed, obviously. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if uh, when it works and we see that it works without uh, putting people at a disadvantage, because you still have to be qualified. Uh, if that is something that could happen and should happen either now or in the future. Thank you. And I actually misspoke, and it, it was not Dr. Titus's bill. It was your daughter's bill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Madam Chair, kidding. we just we may want to get it clear on the I record. I know this is not. I'm totally being <laughs> facetious. I just want that totally on the record. I know her dad. Um, so, are there any other questions? And and just to be clear, um, our committee has taken a look at the two bills, and they are not in conflict or anything. So they can both pass. And it, it, I'm going to Amanda first. <laughs> Stay in your hockey box. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair, Madam Rinsa, Committee Council. That's correct. They're not in conflict, so they can both pass. Thank you very much. <laughs> Assemblyman Flores, did you have a question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome, Senator. I, I don't know if you mentioned this, and I apologize if, if it, you asked, or better said, you answered, and I'm asking again. Uh, did, did you indicate whether or not we have data on the amount of applicants we have who are veterans but are not getting in? In other words, so, so I see the, the language here talking about requesting that we, that, we, that we keep data on the ones we are retaining, the, other, the ones that are being admitted into the programs that we're accepting in. Um, and, and that makes a whole, whole host of sense to me. But I was just trying to understand if, 
we know how many students um, are applying who identify as veterans and maybe are, you know have access to the GI Bill but are being denied. Because um, I'd be curious to know, I think that'd be a strong indicator of, of you know how many veterans were turning away, and I don't know if anybody has any idea as to, to that information. I'm sure if I made Joe Hardy, I, I think that's an excellent point. Um, this does not require it. Um, I, I think it's an excellent point. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, uh, Bryant Ross knows the answer to that, or, or at least some of it, because he deals with that. And so I'm going to phone a friend. Thank you, Senator Hardy. So uh, committee members, yes. So I've been doing this job for nine years. Here's what's happened. I don't have exact data of how many veterans apply, but after 20 years of combat, we have many combat medics and uh, medical corpsmen from the Navy who served with the Marine Corps on multiple tours. And many of them want to continue their career in nursing. And when they get here, I know at UNLV, it's a number of seats, it's very competitive. And if you do not have a 4.0, you can barely get a seat. And so a lot of those veterans get frustrated and leave the state and go to Texas and Florida and other places. I also think Illinois that has some veteran preference to where, yes, you are qualified for all the requirements. You might not have a 4.0, but based on your combat medical experience, uh, you get into uh, those programs. And I know in Florida, they just basically have like five seats for every state uh, school that is earmarked for veterans. So I don't have the exact number. We we're able to get some of those veterans to go to Nevada State College with the intent that they would maybe stay in Nevada and help with the nursing shortage. Same thing with teaching, that they would get into the teaching curriculum and uh, stay here and teach. A lot of them end up paying more expensive uh, education bills to go to Toro University to get their nursing degree. Um, and then they have some problems financially. So that's a little bit of the background that's been going on here for a long time. And uh, there's been discussions with nursing over the years, but you know, obviously academically, it helps, I think, the school to show they have a higher GPA rating for their nursing curriculum students. So uh, there, therein lies the challenge for some veterans to get into the nursing program that have great experience to be a nurse. Thank you. Assemblyman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And if I could just do a quick follow-up. Well, and I think, um, Senator, with what we're doing here in collecting the data of the amount of veterans that we, we're actually enrolling, um, I think there's an opportunity for us to also consider looking at how many we're, we're pushing away. Because if we start doing this, we're going to have to have a, a box that we're checking where you're saying you're a veteran. Um, and I think it'd be easy for us to start tracking also moving forward, how many we're, we're still saying no to. Um, I, I think it'd be useful for uh, the work he's doing. It'd be useful for us to know how many folk we're turning and pushing into other states. Um, and then also to highlight how good of a job we are doing and retaining. Um, so maybe that could be something you could consider, Senator. But, but that, that's up to you, and I'm just bringing it up. Madam Chair, if I may respond. Please. So let me propose this. I think that is an excellent idea. Uh, I am very open to uh, amendments. And if we put that amendment in, quote, unquote, my bill, um, and whether or not it gets a fiscal note or not, I don't care as long as m not my daughter's bill, just to be clear, uh, processes at the same time, uh, I think we have a win-win situation where no matter what, we could do what you're proposing uh, and then do the clean way of doing it. Uh, I'll call it the clean way of doing it with what Assemblywoman Hardy is doing, who is not my daughter, nor my wife, <laughs> to get everything clear. Granddaughter. Uh, or granddaughter. Yeah, good point. Thank you for the compliment. Um, I, I mean, that may be a, a, a very facile 
way to accomplish something and and not risk um, I mean because I don't see a risk then of having somebody say oh that brings a fiscal note and you know how that goes right now so I'm amenable if you would like to do that it's up to you senator <laughs> it's your bill but I I do think it'd be good for us to know not only how many we're keeping but but also how many we're still pushing away I, I think that would be good information thank you are there any other questions from the committee okay so we have assemblywoman Torres and assemblywoman chatty Kathy Hansen <laughs> just teasing <laughs> I apologize, my computer just suddenly froze as soon as I got called on to ask a question. I have no idea what's going on. It's all black. Um, but thank you for your presentation. I, I really do appreciate the intent of the bill. Do we have anybody from Enchi on the line? Because I have a question that might be better suited for them. No, and then, and then I'll, I might just ask the question on the record so that Enchi understands what the question is. Um, and then hopefully they can get back to us so we can just follow up at a later date just so I can get it on the record. Um, I looked at... AB 165 in comparison um, to the bill that we're looking at right now, SB 193. Um, and and I, I, I'm just not understanding why one bill had um, was sent to finance uh, or ways rather on this side and the other bill wasn't. Um, and in comparison to the fiscal notes, it seems that they're the only difference and, and the language is exactly identical um, is that the for whatever reason, the assembly bill version says that there's a greater impact um, impact on small institutions, and I'm so uh, so I'm just kind of hoping that Enchi can kind of clarify that um, and maybe send us some more information on that because it did pass out of this committee, and I, I don't understand why one would have a greater fiscal impact when it's the exact same language. Madam Chair. Welcome to the legislature. <laughs> That's the entirety of your <laughs> Oh my, there's something. Is it a full moon? I don't know. This is, this is. Um, okay, any other? Yes, I'm so, I, I'm so sorry, Assemblywoman. Thank you, Chair. Chatty Kathy for the record. Um, <laughs> So if we followed the idea um, that was discussed, um, I think Mr. Bryant had brought it up, that in some states they have more seats available. Um, I think you mentioned Florida. Um, I'm just curious, and this is probably for legal, if for some reason we had, instead of by preference, we ask ENSHI <laughs> to, or, or the schools to open up maybe a seat or two or three for that are reserved for veterans in addition to what they already allow. Is that something that NCHI can do on their own or do we legislatively have to do that through this bill? Madam Chair, at, at great risk, I'm going to say that NCHI can do whatever they want if we give them the money. And <laughs> So there are limitations, however, on uh, how much money we give because you have space. And the nursing programs, for instance, require a space in order to meet their criteria for being a nursing school. Mm -hmm. So you have space requirements, you have teacher requirements, you know, professor requirements. And heretofore, uh, it, you know, we doubled the nursing size, uh, I don't, know how long ago that was but uh, we literally doubled the nursing side in in uh, NG, uh, at UNR and and we did that legislatively because we said that's what we need to do and we all know that we don't have enough nurses we don't have enough doctors we don't have enough 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 and so yes uh, this this could be a fiscal note much greater than uh, maybe alluding to what Assemblywoman Torres is talking about, alluding to what uh, Assemblywoman Hardy's bill is concerning. So they, 
the people who put uh, Assemblywoman Hardy's bill in finance may be prescient, knowing that you were going to think of that and then say, well, then we need how many million dollars more in Nishi for? But you still have to have the space and you still have to, and to uh, Os Bryant's comment about Turo, this is fair disclosure, I work at Turo and I, um, I'm in a position where I look to train and how to train third and fourth year students in their clinical years. And so you have clinical rotations as well as the space for the uh, textbook years of nursing school. And, and those all have to come together in, you know, in one pathway that, that works. So yes, we can double it, but we have to do something in order to do that. Okay, thank you for raining on my parade. I'll take my ball and go home now. <laughs> thank, thank you, Senator. Well, Madam Chair, if I may, uh, you know, we are having a rainfall of money. Um, I just say that. I, you know, I'm not on the Finance Committee, so don't tell anybody I said that. Um, but, you know, that's reality. Where do we want to spend it? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And were there any other questions from the committee? No. <laughs> I didn't even see you. <laughs> okay. So um, sit back, relax. We'll go to the. Um, I, we, we don't have anyone in here. So and on the Zoom. So we are going to go to BPS. I be, and we might have a call from NG. And um, if there, if you can hear me out there, um, if you want to follow up on Assemblywoman um, Torres's question, so BPS um, callers in support to testify in support of SB one ninety three, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 747, please press star six to unmute. We'll have two minutes. Please state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. Chair and committee members, my name is Andrew Lee Pilbit, last name L E P E I L B. E T, and I represent the Combat Wounded Veterans of the Purple Heart in Nevada, the 65,000 disabled American veterans in the state of Nevada, and I am the current chair of the United Veterans Legislative Council, representing 250,000 veterans in our state and 500,000 Nevadans when you include their families. We are in support of SB 193, and really, we ditto uh, the Senator's comments and Ross Bryant's comments. Uh, it's all we could say at this point, it's the right thing to do. And it is attached to one of our past uh, sessions when we've been so short of nurses and teachers. Uh, that's, I think, one of the reasons that this may have been picked as two key areas, short of teachers and nurses in our state. So this has been going on through the legislature for some years now. And with all the experience these veterans have, we could sure use their talents and get through our schools and hire them in our state. So we support it strongly. Thank you. Thank you very much for your call and support. BPS, next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits of 069. Please state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair of Bill Bray, Axelrod, and committee members. My name is Kanania Spinoza, K-A-N-A-N-I-E-S-P-I-N-O-Z-A, with the Roe Law Group on behalf of the Nevada System of Higher Education. Um, Chair and committee members, to answer uh, Assemblywoman Torres' question, um, I am not, I will relay the message to NSHE and have them get back to the Assemblywoman and committee uh, with the various questions that were asked today. 
But as it stands, and is in support of Senate Bill 193 as written, um, and would like to thank the sponsors, uh, specifically Senator Hardy, for engaging us in this legislation. We will work with the senator on forthcoming amendments um, and get all of that clarifying language to you all. Um, and appreciate that Senator Hardy put on the record, record uh, the clarification for qualifying for specific programs. Uh, in recognition of your all's time, I'd like to thank you for hearing this bill and encourage your support. Um, but I can stand for any other specific questions if needed. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your offer to uh, connect Enchi with uh, Assemblywoman Torrance. Um, I would actually ask if Enchi would connect with the committee, and then we can get the information out to everyone. Next call, next call in support. Is there one? Chair, the line is open and working. However, we have no additional callers in support of SB 193 at this time. Thank you, BPS. With that, I will close testimony in, in support and move on to testimony in opposition. I don't see anyone in here nor on the Zoom, so I will go to you, BPS. Is there anyone on the line in opposition? Chair, the line is open and working. However, we have no callers in opposition to Senate Bill 193 at this time. Thank you, BPS, and I will close testimony in opposition and open testimony in the neutral position. We have one person in the room, but I don't see you, Mr. Marks coming up. So, and I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom. And so BPS, is there anyone on the line for the neutral position? Chair, the line is open and working, but at this time we have no callers in the neutral position for SB 193. I have a feeling I know the answer to this, but did you have any closing comments? I always like to surprise you, Madam Chair. No, I don't. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you for um, making us laugh today. <laughs> Have a great day. So with that, I will close the hearing on SB 193. I don't know why I'm having trouble with that today. Um, and then we'll go to our last agenda item, which is public comment. Um, just a reminder for public comment, it is not to rehear any of the bills we heard. It's just to talk about things that are in the general purview of this committee. So we have someone in the room. Mr. Marks, go ahead on public comment. You have two minutes. Hi, good afternoon. Alexander Marks with the Nevada State Education Association. Uh, like Superintendent Ebert, I'd like to take a moment to uh, gush a little bit about our member, Juliana Urtube on uh, being named uh, 2021's uh, National Teacher of the Year. We are very proud at NSEA to have her as a member, um, as well as our uh, Southern Nevada affiliate, the Nevada, or NEA of Southern Nevada. Um, I'd like to just read a couple of statements from our President Brian Rippett, as well as the NEA President, uh, Becky Pringle, who obviously could not be here today. Um, from Brian Rippett, in a year that was easily one of the most challenging of all of our lives, uh, Juliana has made a profound difference in the lives of her students, as well as her community. Miss Earth, as she is known to many, is the epitome of what it means to be an educator from her focus on educational equity, community gardens and murals, and social and behavioral growth. She's an inspiration to her students as well as a role model for all educators seeking to make a difference in the lives of our children in Nevada. Uh, the NSA family is extremely proud to have her representing our state as well as our union. And then from Becky Pringle, president of the National Education Association, uh, Juliana embodies our core values that public schools and educators should inspire imagination, cultivate curiosity and critical thinking, and ensure all of our students can thrive and live fulfilling lives no matter their race, background, zip code, or ability. She's working to nurture these values today and grow tomorrow's inventors, artists, leaders, and yes, educators. To her, teaching is much more than a job. It's a calling as she strives every day to connect with every student to discover their passions as well as their potential. On behalf of NEA's more than 3 million members, we congratulate Juliana for nurturing a love of learning, helping students grow, setting expectations for students that best meet their learning needs. Her work paves the way for a better, brighter tomorrow for all of our students. Um, NEA, NSEA, and NEASN are excited for her to spend the next year serving as an ambassador for public education and advocating for all educators and students at the state and national level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marks. We are as we said, very excited and such a great representation. <laughs> BPS, do we have anyone on the line for public comment? If you wish to make public comment at this time, please press 
star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the line is open and working, but we have no callers for public comment at this time. Thank you, BPS, and thank you, members. Um, we will be meeting on Tuesday, May 11th at 1.30, and we're doing really well. Um, I think we have two bills scheduled for that day, so I think we're going we're gonna to make it. So thank you, everyone, for uh, spending the afternoon with me. <laughs> this meeting's adjourned.